Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Well, hey everyone, welcome to our study in the Key Chapters of God's Word. Hope you're having a great day today. Today, we're going to be looking at 1 Kings chapter 17. We're going to be introduced to a key prophet for the Jewish people named Elijah. Now, Elijah's name means the Lord is God, and that's going to be his message, and we're just going to see how that unpacks over the next several days. As we go into our passage here, we began yesterday just unpacking how the kingdom had divided after Solomon's death into the northern kingdom consisting of ten tribes and the southern kingdom consisting of two tribes. Solomon's son Rehoboam ruled the southern kingdom. Jeroboam ruled the northern kingdom. Unfortunately, neither was a good king, and Jeroboam started the north on a trajectory towards increasing rebellion to the Lord. And that rebellion to the Lord just continues growing throughout the kings of the north. And then we come to chapter 17, where we see the the reign of King Ahab. King Ahab was a particularly evil king. And if you were to look back just at chapter 16, you would see in the last few verses there, it just talks about how he's done more evil than all the other kings before him. And in verse 31, he even marries Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, the king of the Sidonians. And they're in this region of Sidon, which is just the epicenter of Baal worship. So Ahab is in full-blown rebellion against the Lord. and He's given himself over to Baal worship. Now Baal, B-A-A-L, was just another god who promised power and prosperity. He was technically the god of nature and fertility and rain. And since basically nature and fertility and rain dictate prosperity, if you want to be rich in their world, you got to go to Baal. And so Ahab was a Baal worshiper. He marries the daughter of this Baal priest named Jezebel, and she tries to make Baalism the national religion of the land. She even executes a whole bunch of prophets of the Lord. And this whole situation wasn't good for the people of God because this is all so tempting. Uh, They look and say, man, our prophets are getting killed. Baal seems to be giving prosperity. Maybe we should follow him. Well, now we come to chapter 17. We're introduced to this prophet named Elijah. Now we see the intestinal fortitude of Elijah right here in verse 1, because he says to Ahab, and this is the king of Israel, he says to him, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, remember his name means the Lord lives, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Now they're in this agrarian economy, they require rain. This is a declaration that basically the Lord's going to shut down Israel's economy to show his power. And so here the Lord's prophet Elijah goes to Ahab, the king, basically for Baal worship and says, you know what? The Lord is going to shut down Israel until you recognize who he is. And to make his point super clear, he picks on or addresses the very thing that Baal claimed to have most control over. He's going to shut that down to show God's power over everything, including rain. Well, you can imagine this doesn't go over real well. And so the Lord tells him, you know, it's probably time to head out. And he heads out to the brook of Cherith, which is even beyond the Jordan River. And so while he's there, this whole region is under something of a famine. And so the Lord miraculously provides bread and meat to him from the ravens. But even then, eventually this brook dries up. It was probably just a seasonal brook. And so the Lord sends him to Zarephath. Now, Zarephath is all the way back to the west, kind of along the, the edge of the Mediterranean Sea up north. And that, remember, going back to 1 Kings 16, 31, that is the epicenter of Baal worship. That's where Jezebel is from. She's the one who murders the Lord's prophets. And Elijah is going right there into that that hotbed of hostility. Well, he arrives at Zarephath and he meets a widow who is starving with a famine. She thinks she's pretty much a goner. In verse 12, she thinks she's cooking her last meal before she dies. But if you look at verse 12, notice what she starts to say to Elijah. She says, as the Lord your God lives. And so this seems to be a woman who is sitting here surrounded by Baal worshipers and she is still putting her faith and trust in the Lord. Even back in verse 9, the Lord has commanded her to provide for Elijah. So at some level, she's a follower of God here. And so she does what Elijah asks, and she prepares the food, and she gives it to him. And miraculously, the Lord provides for her and for her son, and they don't run out of food. Now, you would think that all would be well here. But then, in verse 17, the widow's son dies. I'm Just to show us that even when God is working, we still have to deal with the reality of life as well. Well, understandably, she is devastated by the loss of her son, and so she's quick to blame Elijah. But Elijah takes this as another opportunity to show the Lord's power and his glory. So he prays over this boy, and he comes back to life. Now, we call this an event a resuscitation rather than a resurrection, because the true resurrection will be when Jesus returns and gathers his people into his kingdom. Now, those who are resurrected will not die. But all these other people like this boy here or Lazarus later on, these are resuscitations because those folks eventually do die. 
But we have here the Lord stepping in, giving life to this boy, once again, demonstrating his power, because here they are in the, the seed bed, the epicenter of all worship, who is supposed to be the God of life as well. And here we're seeing, no, it's the Lord who brings this boy back to life. And so that's the basic gist of what's happened in this passage here. And there's a few reasons why we need to know about this chapter. The first is that this just introduces us to Elijah. Elijah is a key person over the next several chapters. He's going to always be a key person in the Jewish perspective of God's work among his people. You see, Elijah and the next prophet, Elisha, these two prophets together represent one of these extended periods of time where the Lord provides and teaches through signs and wonders, calling people to himself. The first was when God used Moses to perform all kinds of signs during the Exodus. Now we are in the age of Elijah and Elisha, and we're reading about that now. Then we're going to see miraculous signs during the early church as God's calling people to him there. And the final era has yet to come, and that will be at the end times in the book of Revelation. These are all eras in the working of God amongst people where he uses signs and wonders to show his reality and call people to himself. And so it's just helpful for us to know that Elijah and Elisha were two of those guys, and we're reading about them right now. This passage also shows us the, the faithfulness of God to his covenant promises. Here we're seeing that Israel's kings were disobedient to the Lord, and their present king, Ahab, was actually a worshiper of Baal. And this is a desperate situation where the Lord sends now this prophet on the scene to remind the people through these miracles of signs and wonders that they were still the people of God, and they were still in a covenant relationship with him. Another reason why this is a key chapter is because the Lord refers to it, Jesus refers to it in Luke chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. And the Lord refers to this event as an indication that God has always had a heart to care for the Gentiles. Here there's all these other widows that he could have gone to, but he goes to a widow in the land of Sidon, a distinctly Gentile, even Baal-worshipping people. We just see God's heart here. He's calling us in the fellowship with him. This passage also shows us the power of prayer. The book of James in James 5.17, it refers back to this passage here. It reminds us that God withheld rain in response to one man's prayer. That our God, in some way that we don't fully understand, hears our prayers, even if it's a single person's prayers. And if we just call upon him, he hears that prayer and often we will see the answer. Sometimes it will be very clear, sometimes it won't be, but we know that God hears our prayers. It's not as though we need to somehow stack our prayers together, or the more prayers we get, the better God's going to hear our prayers. We just need to know that God hears our prayers, even when it's a single man. And so that's chapter 17 here, a chapter that shows us that God was calling people to himself, even when they're disobedient to him, and he's just setting the stage for chapter 18, which is one of the most powerful passages in this section of Old Testament history. I look forward to unpacking chapter 18 with you tomorrow. Hope you have a great day. Thanks and God bless.